Um, first of all, just some introduction. I'd like to thank you know PubNub for letting me be here and having me. Um, but I work for BitPay, and everyone calls me JJ, except for my mother who calls me Christopher. Um, <laughs> So yeah, mostly I work on really low-level Bitcoin stuff, like the Bitcoin protocol and stuff. Um, so we at BitPay had this sort of conceptual idea, it was sort of amorphous at the time, but we thought, what if we could compile the official Bitcoin implementation as a library instead of an executable? And as it happens, one of the core devs, Vladimir, of, of Bitcoin had actually tried that in the past, except he did it a little bit differently. He split it up into multiple libraries, depending on what you needed, and used libtool. Um, if you don't know what libtool is, it's, you, you can have sort of, libtool has its own little shared libraries, it's kind of weird, but um, that pull request got rejected. Um, so let me just dive right in to what Bitcoin DJS is and what we call libbitcoind.so. Libbitcoind.so is the shared object, the shared library that's compiled from Bitcoin D. So here is the basic architecture. You see Bitcoin D there, that's the Bitcoin core source code. Um, it's compiled as a library, not an executable file. And uh, it eventually comes with Bitcoin D.SO. Now, anything can link to that. You can link to it from C. You can write a binding for it in Node.js, in Ruby, in Python, in Lua, whatever you want. Um, there are some issues with that, and I'll delve, in, I'll delve into that later. But um, um, so, once it's libbitcoind.so, it's dynamically loaded the DL open system call uh, into bitcoind.js, which is a Node.js module. So, you can access official Bitcoin functions from Node.js. Now, what can you do with this? You can make a wallet, you can make a blockchain explorer, you can make a you know, and if you want to start up a new BitPay, you can have it as your backend, right? It's, it's very, very hard to um, manage things just with Bitcoin D on the command line. Their RPC calls are horrible and extremely limited. And in the past, I've tried to add some more RPC calls, and uh, all my pull requests got shut down. So, um, I eventually created something called TermCoin. And TermCoin is a Bitcoin wallet, except it runs in your terminal. So it's a complete terminal interface, and originally it used Bitcoin D RPC calls. So as you can imagine, it's extremely limited. It's hard to add recipients. You couldn't, uh, you couldn't delete recipients. You couldn't delete your addresses. You had barely any control over it, but it worked, sort of. Um, and at that point, I just I, I, I wished so much for something better. Um, that's when I discovered uh, Fedora Dutney's Bitcoin. And um, you may remember Fedora Dutney, who was the first person to make the proof of concept that you could steal a private key from a server using Heartblade. He was in the news and, and everything like that. And I actually worked with Fedora at Nojitsu. So I was very familiar with this code. And I mean, I had been maintaining this code for two years, almost. And uh, so yeah, I discovered Bitcoin, and I, I loved it immediately because I was just, I was so in line with his coding style. And I, I like Bitcore too, but Bitcoin sort of drew me closer because it had a Bit37 implementation. Now, Bit37 means you don't need to download the entire blockchain to make a wallet, essentially. Bitcoin J uses it. I mean, if you have wallets on your phone, on your iPhone, if you have Red Wallet, on your Android device, if you have Android S's wallet, um, that's Bit 37. So you don't have to download the entire blockchain on your device. So I thought, great, this is fantastic. I can finally make a real wallet and it doesn't have to download the entire blockchain. 
But there was one thing missing. I wanted to make a blockchain explorer that was part of the wallet. And not just a blockchain explorer that makes some HTTP request to blockchain.info. I wanted a totally local blockchain explorer. And so this idea we had a good day to make with BitcoinD.so and BitcoinD.js sort of sprang from an obsession of my own that I had been working on for a long time. So not only is a primary benefit you the entire blockchain on your disk, there are also many other benefits to, um, to having the official Bitcoin implementation on your disk. One, you have to make it, I would love to say that all the alternative Bitcoin implementations that I've worked on are bug for bug compatible with the official implementation, because you know it all has bugs. If you've ever looked on Bitcoin Talk or the mailing list, you know that the official implementation has bugs. And that's the protocol, you know, whether you like it or not, that it, you, you have to implement those bugs, even though they're bugs, right? So that's another benefit of using the official implementation. I would love to say all my alternative implementations are perfect and don't have bugs, but deep down I know that they are not the official protocol because they don't implement the correct bugs. One great example of this is Peter Todd's SIG hash single. And um, I don't know. Could anyone tell me what's wrong with this piece of code right here? If anyone's familiar with C++, it's in it's in uh, the main Bitcoin tree. You notice there's an error return. Um, you pass in a script code, which is a, a script state in this case, and then a transaction object, the number of the input, and then a hash type. And if everything goes goes okay you get hash back. If everything doesn't go okay, you get print F, error, sig hash, blah, 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 um, but it returns a one. And that one is actually an error code. Now, if you see the return value is a unit 256. So that one gets cast to a unit 256. So Bitcoin thinks is a hash. And instead of handling it as an error, it actually takes it as a real hash. So it doesn't, it doesn't, you know, it doesn't deal with error. There's no error in there. So there, there's a huge, huge problem there. But for better or for worse, it's part of the protocol. So my main explanation here is um, you need to make things bug for bug compatible. And if you don't, as Peter Todd said, the world ends. You end up forking the blockchain. You end up accepting blocks that are not meant to be accepted. You know, you can't validate them properly. You can't validate the Merkle tree and the Merkle root and this and that. Uh, so if you implement an alternative implementation, even if you think it's perfect, even if the crypto is perfect, even if, even if you know beyond a doubt that you implemented it correctly according to whatever specification you read on Bitcoin would be, you could still be wrong. So, as, as much as I hate to say, you need the official implementation if you're doing something where anything major is at stake, or a company is at stake, or a lot of money is at stake. You want to use the official implementation. And before this, you could only use Bitcoin D on the command line, which, again, is severely limited. So this is what Bitcoin DJS looks like when the Bitcoin D.SO is compiled. Um, you can link to it from a C++ binding in Node.js. Now this is not specific to Node.js. You could do this in Ruby, Lua, Python, anything you want, any language you're familiar with. You could link to the Bitcoin D.SO and you could make a line report for that language, and you could start calling official functions from Python or Ruby, and in this case, JavaScript. So what's happening here 
is you require the Bitcoin A.js. And once it opens, that code is actually wrong, and that, that should be in the open event. Once it opens, you can do Bitcoin unblock. And you can watch all the blocks from it. As soon as it's open, the blockchain just starts downloading. It literally is Bitcoin D. And it just downloads the blockchain. You can watch all the blocks from it 500 at a time. You can see every transaction. You can see the addresses. Um, so the C blocks and the C transactions, which are the paying for the classes of blocks and transactions in the, in the Bitcoin source code, um, get converted to JavaScript objects. So that's, that's very, very useful. I think this is uh, sort of the end of the slides here. So I would like to show you a demonstration. So we'll go to a test net faucet here. So first of all, let's start up TermCoin, which now uses Bitcoin DJS as a backend. When you see this wallet, you are actually seeing the official Bitcoin D in the same process as Node.js. So let's start that up. I'm just doing debug because I want you to test that for this. I don't want to lose all my Bitcoin. Because it is, it is still beta. You may see some little quirks with it. So we do uh, debug, turn point, back then, Bitcoin DJS. So now it's got to parse the blockchain, much like uh, Bitcoin D does. And now uh, let's see. I have one peer. And as you can see down there, there's the blockchain status. I think that's that a wallet? Updated. Excuse me? Is that a wallet? Yes. Yeah. This is term coin, the wallet I was speaking about. And uh, it uses Bitcoin DJS and pack. And so those are the recent transactions, the number of confirmations, the total balance. So um, let's go to a test net faucet. And uh, we can put our address in there. So I'll copy and paste it. And let's see if I can figure out this caption. <laughs> <laughs> OK, I think I got that one. You only have to get one of them right. I think that's OK. Yep. Okay, successfully sent. So now, now we will see that transaction come in. Here it is right now. So we see our transaction, zero confirmations. Um, assuming within maybe 10, 5 minutes, that will get confirmed. But to prove to you that this wallet actually works, I'm going to open up Andreas's test net wallet on my phone. So this is, I, I'm, I'm sorry it's hard for you to see, but this is Andreas's test net wallet. And it's on my phone. And in certain point right now, you can actually scan QR codes. It, it's really cool. It only works on Linux. I'm sorry you use those specs to pick the wrong operating system. <laughs> That's a problem. Um, no, I, I actually didn't. Um, I'm, I'm nice to OSX people. So, in, uh, in, in, you see here, you can actually scan the QR code. Um, but since I'm using this in a VM, I'm going to have to do it on my main machine. So, I have a little function there. So, I, let's, see, let's see if I can scan my QR code here. Okay. And, there we go. Okay. So if you were using Sermon Point and uh, you would just get your Bitcoin address right there. So now that we have our testnet address for our phone, we can go in here and say pay to this address. And uh, how much I have? Let's uh, point oh one. So if you didn't hear that, that was the sound of money being put into my <laughs> test net wall. I'm sorry, I should have held it up for a moment. Um, but now 
program, you can, you can actually see that there. So I have now 0.0125 testnet coins on bridge. Um, this testnet um, transaction apparently <coughs> hasn't confirmed yet. Now, the other thing you'll notice um, on this screen is there's one tab called Explore. That is the blockchain explorer. And it is totally local. It's on your local disk. It uses Bitcoin D functions to get the blocks, to get the transactions, this and that. <coughs> so this it, it automatically shows the latest block. Not necessarily the, the latest block in history, only the latest block you downloaded. So right now we're looking, we're looking at the latest block. We can go down and see all the transactions. We can see all the headers. And uh, if we hit T, we can look at all the transactions and select one. So let's look at uh, this guy. OK, so now we see his transaction. Now, the problem with this in, in Bitcoin D is when, if you want to use this for a blockchain score, the problem is Bitcoin D, when it stores the blockchain as level DD, as I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, usually it's a prefix, it's a key value store. We use a prefix, and Bitcoin uses B, and then the log hash, and T, and then the transaction ID. Um, but there's no A. It stores some other metadata, but there's no A. And what I mean by that is it doesn't keep track of what transactions pertain to which addresses. So on blockchain.info, right, you want to look at an address and see exactly what transaction is done. The only way to do this on Bitcoin DJS is to scan the entire blockchain, you know, over 300,000 blocks. Obviously, that would take a long time. Um, the other way to do it is to maintain your own index or I'm kind of tempted to do this, to write to Bitcoin D's blockchain level DB yourself and add keys to it. You could do that in theory, and it, and it hopefully wouldn't break anything. <laughs> um, so, uh, yeah, I mean, we look at, all right, so let's pick an address here. We'll look at this guy. So it's loading right now. So you notice it took a little, uh, it took a while to load there. Um, that's because I'm only looking at the last 20,000 blocks. And uh, the last 20,000 blocks is a couple months, maybe something like eight months. Um, so we see the transaction we just looked at. Um, but right now it's not scaling the entire blockchain. That would take a long time. And ideally you would cache it, but it was still, no one wants to wait there for 10 minutes while you scan a whole blockchain, right? So there are solutions to this that may be implemented in Bitcoin DJS. So now that you've seen a uh, demonstration, oh, it's still like you confirmed. Let's look at that. Now that you've seen a demonstration of that, when I originally forked, Bitcoin, to make it into bitcoind.so, to make it into a library, um, I tried to change it as little as possible. I tried to make it as digestible as possible for the core of Bitcoin devs to accept, so that when you compile Bitcoin or Bitcoin D, um, you can optionally make it a library just with a bigger play. And that's what I did. And I submitted it as a pull request. And there was lots of controversy and a lot of debate about it. Uh, this is my pull request. It explains how you could use it just as a simple C++ program. Obviously, you're not going to be using it that way. Um, but after all of that, it, um, yeah, it was close. Um, in the future, we hope to get it in. That's it. The main point of contention here was that the Bitcoin developers didn't want to develop Bitcoin as a library. 
because Bitcoin's program, right, it changes internally all the time. It changes the functions, the classes, this and that. And um, so they said, we don't want to develop this as a library because we have to, we can't change anything anymore. And I said, you know what, leave that to the binding developers. You can compile this as a library. And when I originally made the Bitcoin DIA, so I forked Bitcoin version 0.9.0. Code from eight months ago. And when I, I, I made Bitcoin me.js, the binding to Node.js, and had all the, all, all the functions there that you could access from JavaScript. And yeah, I just want to reiterate, reiterate um, term plan is totally JavaScript. It's, it doesn't even touch C++, only Bitcoin me.js. So um, I said, you know what? Just leave the code changes up to the binding developers. You don't even have to care that this is a library. I, I, I changed eight months worth of code, eight months of changes um, to get things working again. And it took an afternoon. You know, it, it, didn't, it didn't really matter. You guys don't have to develop this as a library, but it's just dealing with Bitcoin pull requests sometimes Half of the message gets through sometimes, a third of the message gets through. It's very hard. I only had two or three Bitcoin core devs on my side on this. Uh, Vladimir, you know, obviously sympathized with me um, because he had made a library before that got rejected. And uh, my good friend Jeff also sympathized with me and argued for it. And, uh, but eventually it was a no-go. So BitPay, we are maintaining our own fork of Bitcoin, which allows you to compile it as a library if you want. Now, TurnPoint was just a proof of concept. It was to prove that I could make a wallet and a local blockchain explorer out of the real Bitcoin code. Our ultimate goal at Bitpay is to make Bitcoin E.js the backend for our blockchain explorer, Insight. If you haven't used Insight, you should check it out, Google it or Insight Bios. Um, and it's a really good blockchain explorer. But right now, we maintain our own, you know, index for addresses and transactions, and these little deviations and that. But we want to use the official implementations who are guaranteed to have the correct blockchain. So that is the ultimate goal. We have a lot of projects. We have Bitcore, we have Copay, but then we have Insight. And you can run Bitcore, you can run Copay, and you can run Insight all on your own machine. It's yours, it's nobody else's. It's that, and that's the whole point of Bitcoin, right? It's just, it's peer to peer, you know? There's no centralized place, it's that. You can run it yourself, anybody can. And that's the whole point. So that's the ideal for Bitcoin. JS. And um, yeah, so the, um, that's our ultimate goal. And uh, yeah, the pull request got closed, but we will keep maintaining it. And um, it was just, there was a lot of debate and controversy over this when I made this pull request. It, it, it was really rough, and, and then my arguments seemed to go through. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it should be possible for a binding maintainer for whatever language to maintain this and deal with the code changes in Bitcoin. The other problem you might run into while using a little Bitcoin D.S.O., Bitcoin Qualys library, is some languages, Node.js uses C++ for its binding modules. Um, other, language, other languages use C. Um, I think uh, Ruby uses C for its bindings, right? So you write Ruby bindings in C. Any Ruby people here? Okay. Okay, yes, right there. <laughs> okay, yeah, so you write Ruby modules in C. Um, so that presents a problem because Bitcoin is written in C. And C is an old, horrible language that was originally just a pre preprocessor that compiled the C. And obviously in C, you can't have two functions with the same name. But in C++, you can because they're in different classes. So 
So it mangles the name, puts the class in front of it to, to make double work. Um, so in order to write a binding for, say, Ruby, using libbitcoindata.so, you would have to uh, write sort of a wrapper. You would write it in C++ and wrap all the functions you need from the official Bitcoin code, the Bitcoin data as code. And um, once you do that, you can wrap it in an entire block, x term, quote, c, close quote. And that basically tells the compiler not to mangle these names so that you can use them from C. I personally have that started on this wrapper, which I think would be great because then every language that uses a C binding could use this. Um, but I haven't started on it. Somebody else can start on it. I, I plan to start on it. It's all up in the air now. It's, it's, it can go any direction. I really hope to see people using this as bindings for their own language. I hope to see a Python guy use this to, to make a Python wallet or a blockchain explorer or a backend for some server. Um, but for C bindings, you may have to write the wrapper first. And uh, someone's going to do it. If it's not me, I hope it's someone else. You know, uh, it could be anyone. And that's the point of open source, right? It, right now, it's all up in the air. It can go any direction. And uh, so does anyone have any questions about the, I, I may not have explained this entirely thoroughly. Quick question for you. Yes. I see Sipa said, talks about um, API breakage and that you know the core devs are working actively towards modularizing. Do you have any insight into how active they are doing that? And right. Um, well, Jeff Garza told me that they are moving the script code out into its own library um, because script is the source of most of the bugs in Bitcoin. And uh, yeah, so that way, um, you know, any language that use the script implementation, that's totally accurate, and alternative implementations don't have to implement. Um, that's all I've heard so far, is they want to move the script implementation out. Um, and I think that's a great idea, but uh, my library is different. It's the entire thing. So if there are any bugs in Bitcoin, you get them too, and you get the real Bitcoin protocol. Yeah. Um, did you, I mean, were, were there performance improvements using uh, your, your shared library versus RPC calls, or was, was that, yes. any, was that um, any motivation? Good question. Uh, yes. While there is a uh, overhead in Node.js, when you make a Node.js binding, it's in C++, you compile it to machine code, you, uh, you know, dynamically load it. Um, there is overhead to doing that in Node.js. I can only speak for Node.js here. And there's there's overhead to talking to what we call C++ plan in Node.js. There's overhead for that. But I think what far outweighs that is the ability to use the official code. And in Bitcoin in JS, all the blocking code, all the blocking functions in Bitcoin are made asynchronous. So it is going to be faster than an alternative implementation. It's going to be faster than something written in JavaScript. Because all the crypto is there, and it's in C++, and it's machine code. So it probably is going to be faster, pretty much guaranteed. Like MF versus using RPC calls, right? Yes, yes, so uh, our RPC calls too. Because RPC calls, you have to make a you know, JSON HTTP request, right? And uh, the, that's a lot of I/O, and you have to talk to a separate server. It's it's um, so yeah, there would be much less overhead because it's in the same process. Any other questions? Yeah. Uh, are there any new gotchas like uh, like is everything called called by Linux passes back errors or the most of this stuff? Yes, it's it's, 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 it's it's a whole Node.js style. So. As you saw on my last slide, it's event, right? You use Bitcoin dot open, and that's when you know the blockchain has started to be downloaded. And then you can use Bitcoin on block, Bitcoin on trend, 
transaction, see all the transactions, see all the blocks, see all the peers come in. Um, but say you want to send a transaction. Uh, there are two ways to do that. One is to build a transaction itself. You can set the outputs in just you know raw script and uh, the amount you want to pay. And Bitcoin EJS will automatically fill in the available inputs, the available unspent outputs you have, and make that transaction for you and send it. The other way is to call a function that you simply put an address and an amount in, and by your uncle, it goes out. Um, so, um, sorry, what was the original question? <laughs> uh, like, how, uh, like, does the node API? Right, yeah, yeah, that's right. All, all yeah, so, yeah, it, it is all callback call based. It is all asynchronous, and it's invented for where events are appropriate and, uh, and whatnot. So, both of those transaction functions I just mentioned are asynchronous. You pass in a callback, and you get a callback once the transaction is broadcasted and acknowledged by peers. Yeah, any more questions? Yes. My reflection is that there's um, some difficulty in uh, fetching arbitrary, using Bitcoin D, fetching arbitrary transactions or something. That is true. In the RPC, um, this is one of the limits of Bitcoin D RPC. With Bitcoin D RPC, you can only get transactions that are part of your wallet. They're, they they live in your wallet. They're, they're, they pertain to you, so you cannot get any arbitrary transaction that has nothing to do with you. It'll just return it. I actually I tried doing it. I tried changing an RPC call, and compiling the D again, and it just gives you back an empty transaction. So, uh, but with Bitcoin DJS and with Bitcoin DSO, you can call uh, get transaction, and it will read the blockchain and get any arbitrary transaction you want. So there was a, there is a problem with that. You're right. There is a problem with RPC calls. You can't get any arbitrary transaction. But with libbitcoin.sl, whatever binding you make for it, you can get any transaction, any block. So um, and it also it also goes through every transaction on the block to you know reads the inputs to try to figure out the address and this and that. Um, back across some I.O. right now, it's done synchronously, that part. Um, and I'm looking at doing that uh, asynchronously in the future. So it doesn't block the main process. Anyone else? Yeah. Um, like, how you as a shared library, do you open yourself up to more vulnerabilities, like security-wise? That's a good question. Um, Whenever a new wallet comes out, there's always a cry for, um, you know, a security audit on the code. The bottom line is, I don't know yet, but I think you may have less vulnerabilities because literally all it is is just a wrapper around the official code. The main vulnerability I would see is when you encrypt the wallet. Oh, uh, you pass in a passphrase, right? And you're doing this from JavaScript or Python or whatever. But if you do it from JavaScript, that passphrase stays in memory until the garbage collector cleans it up. But even then, it's still in memory. It's not zero, right? So the correct way to do it would be to pass in a buffer and then zero it once you're done. Um, so that's one vulnerability I see, is that there's no way to zero strength. There's no way to free in zero strings in JavaScript. So that passphrase will stay in memory. And if there's any rogue process out there that's running as root, they can read other process memory, it can get your passphrase. That's one vulnerability I see. And I'm hoping to fix that in the future, to just use buffers. And then that way you can zero the buffer afterwards, because buffers are allocated outside of the V8. Yeah, that way it would be more secure. So there are potentially some vulnerabilities, but at the same time, I like to think that there are less. 
because it's using the image code and not an alternative implementation. I think the previous question when you said that something was still synchronous. So, uh, right. so is like everything asynchronous or are there still a couple of things? Pretty much everything is asynchronous. The one thing I mentioned is not asynchronous right now um, because it goes through every transaction in a block. And um, it had, because when you want to block the transactions, you want to get the previous outputs in the inputs, right? So you have to look at the transaction ID of the previous transaction and the index of that previous output, get that transaction, and then put the previous output in the input. That's the only way it's useful, right? Um, so it does that, and right now it does it synchronously. Um, I do have code written that hasn't been tested that will do it asynchronously in the future. But so mostly everything else is... Yeah, what, pretty much everything else is completely asynchronous callback base. Uh, I, I can't really think of anything else that's not uh, asynchronous. So. Well, we need to Well, Insight is, is a blockchain explorer. Well, it's build a blockchain explorer. Build a blockchain explorer. Well, like I said, it's, um, it's bug for bug compatible with the actual blockchain, the actual protocol. There's no chance that you might fork the blockchain accidentally you know, by accepting a block that shouldn't be accepted, and this and that. So, and it's just, it stays in the same process. So you don't have another. You don't need to have another process over here writing a level ID and then reading from it. It's just, it's a little bit cleaner, it's a little bit faster. Um, so there are major benefits to it, whether you make a blockchain or a wallet, or like I said, a backend for some kind of company like this, if you want to make one. Yes? This could be a bad question, but uh, I don't, do, you, do you know the differences between Libcoin and Lib Bitcoin? You know, there's like no Bitcoin. I know the Bitcoin. Bitcoin. Yeah. I'm not sure about that. Okay. Anyway, there, there are different projects that are using it. I think they're, they're doing similar things with compile, trying to compile static libraries. Static libraries. Oh, well, I'm compiling a shared library. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Well, that's cool. I've never heard of it. I'll have to look it up. Um, have they, do you know if they've written any bindings for? Different languages or anything like that? Uh, I don't. I don't think so. Okay. Well, I'll definitely look into that. That sounds <coughs> cool. Maybe we could team up. You know, that's a I don't know that I have a bad question. Okay. Um. So yeah. Anyone else have questions about? Yes. Um. With with RPC, uh, and correct me if I'm wrong. I might be making assumptions. Um, since it's a network call, you can be running the Bitcoin process on a network server, not the one that you're trying to run with your blockchain for. Um, could you do that with this, or does this have to have the process running with it? You could actually, um, because LibBitcoin D.SO is Bitcoin D. So you could set up an RPC server if you wanted to. You could set up the I actually have the option. When you instantiate here, I'll go to the slide just to show you the uh, the options it has. <laughs> so you can give it like a so right? when you instantiate Bitcoin from Bitcoin.js, um, you can give it an option. You can say I want to test that. Or you can do an option called RPC, and it will set up an RPC for you, an RPC server for you, and you can also give it a data mirror. And the data mirror argument in Bitcoin it tells you tells it what directory to download the blockchain in, and which which is the Bitcoin.com and, and whatnot. So you can actually have multiple instances of um, Bitcoin D.js or the Bitcoin D.so through whatever languages. You can have multiple instances of that by just having different directories. And obviously that would get pretty big if you're downloading like 
vibe of the same blockchain. That will be a raid set up or something. Um, but yes, you can start an RPC server. You can get it to RPC often, and it will have a, a full RPC server. When you do that, do you become limited by the things you were mentioning uh, that RPC is limited by? Yes, yes, absolutely. Because I wanted to change Bitcoin as little as possible. I, I only wanted to change the build. I wanted to take the main function out, put it into its own file, so it's not a program, and uh, just expose a few functions that shouldn't be exposed, or make a you know make a function and class instead of private, make it public, so that you know programs like Bitcoin E.js can actually use them. So I tried not to muck around with anything else. Didn't, I didn't touch the RPC stuff, so the RPC stuff will be the same. What, what do you think it would take to get your pull request accepted? Like, do you need to wait for the point core to stabilize their guy a little bit? Do you, does, does there need to be more demand for these kind of things? I'm not sure. I mean, <laughs> the, main, the main argument against it was they didn't want to design it like a library. Right? They didn't want to make it um, stable. They wanted to be able to change everything in it, you know, at the drop of a hat. And that would, that would break any binding like Bitcoin DJS. And uh, they didn't want to do that. And I explained to them over and over that, look, leave that to the, you know, mining developers. We'll do it. And eight, eight months of it in an afternoon. And, uh, I don't know. I don't know if the message got through or not. Um, but the conversation sort of ended, and after a few weeks, the pull request was closed. Um, maybe the conversation will start up again. Um, I don't. I don't think there's anything else we can do to make libbitcoin.so um, more digestible than Bitcoin does. I mean, it really is. You can just ignore it if you're if you're working on Bitcoin. It's just another configure flag. It's a configure option. Um, so you don't even have to pay attention to it. You can, it's a separate make file. You you can just ignore it and pretend it doesn't exist, and it really won't matter because the binding developers, the person who writes the C wrapper, they can all update it themselves. That should be their job. So you don't have to worry about making the functions library based or a library like it. Did that answer your question? Sure. Yeah. Okay, well, we'll see where it goes, right? We're gonna we're gonna maintain a fork of it. Uh, and you get it for insight. And um, maybe in some time the conversation will start up again. Are you looking for folks to work on the repo? Um, on your project on this? Of course. So what is, what's top of mind? I, I, would, I would love people to contribute pull requests, I, you know, whatever they can. I would love people to write, most of all, I would love people to write bindings for other languages like Python and Ruby and so on. I think that would be fantastic. And uh, 